It's all good. All right. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Nice and loud. All right. Oh, how are we this evening? Good, good, good. Amen. Good stuff. So, what are we in? We're in the new year, aren't we? <clears throat> yeah, 2022. Yeah. Anytime um, I think a new calendar circles around and we come to January 1st again, you know, it, our minds instantly go, if we've been at this for any amount of time, our, our minds instantly go to Isaiah 43. And uh, <clears throat> I'm going to start reading in verse 16. It says, this is what the Lord says, he who made a way through the sea and a path through the mighty waters who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Verse 18, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. Verse 19, see, I do a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? How many times already, it's January 5th, have we seen that posted? Have we heard somebody quote it? Have we, oh, it's January 1st, God's doing a new thing. We do it, right? He says, I'm making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. And I mean, what's not to love about that scripture, right? Every single thing it talks about. Yeah, that's a great one to grab a hold of. What's not, um, what's not to love about it? It's exciting and it's invigorating and it's full of such hope and such promise. And, and we would want to grab a hold of that, right? Uh, invigoration in our spirit, something to grab a hold of, to look forward to. God's doing a new thing. Hmm. But tonight, what if we not focus on the new thing that God is doing as it being something that is going to be done uh, outwardly? What if instead we saw it as a new thing he desired to do inwardly? Ha! Huh. A new thing moving through you. That's what we're going to be delving into this evening in the message titled, New Year, New Wineskins. And so first of all, I hope we realize that we don't need a new year to start for us to have a new start with God. Do we understand that? I mean, Jeremiah tells us, right, so like vividly and so elementary, his mercies are new every day, right? It's found in Lamentation chapter 3, verse 22 and, or, yeah, 22 and 23. You know, great is your faithfulness and his compassions fail not and his mercies are new every morning and, and all those things. So we don't need January 1st to roll around in order to have a fresh start with God. I mean, have any of us went on a weight loss journey or a weight loss adventure and like it's Thursday and you go, guess when I'm starting? Monday. Because you can't start on a Thursday. You have to start on a Monday, right? Yeah. Why is that? Because it gives us more time to eat before we start, like, right? Well, it's the same thing. We don't have to start until January 1st to get a fresh start with God. And guess what? God doesn't wait around until January 1st before he begins to do a new thing. But since we are at the time of a new year, it is a great time to start thinking along these lines. It is a great time to, to rise up in a fresh start with God. It is a great time to go, you know what, I'm going to buckle down a little harder this year. I'm going to read my Bible a little more. I'm going to do this a little more. I'm going to do that a little bit more. God, what do you have for me this year? You know, um, I was in a, a lady's... Bible study a long time ago with um, my mama was the teacher and there were quite a few of us women and this is like Gabriel was a baby and he's 19 now so this was a long time ago but one thing that my mom challenged all of us to do as women in that group was to pray on and ask God for a verse for the year and that is something that many of us who were in that group continued to do even today, long after, almost two decades after this class, okay, is to get, Lord, give me a word for this year. Give me a scripture for this year. Something that no matter what goes on, 12 months is a long time, right? That I can refer back to that and see just what all you had in store for those things, okay? So we don't need a new 
a new year to have a new start with him, but a new year does kind of put us in the mindset of those things, okay? So this new thing that we often hear of, I am doing a new thing, all right, often we see that or we tend to look at that as something on the horizon or something that's going to happen outwardly, okay? But I want us to focus tonight on what if it's something that he has planned for us inwardly followed by a new thing that is going to come out of us, all right? And that's exciting, and I hope you guys are excited. So what if, yes, amen, (laughs) what if we considered our idea of God doing a new thing as God making his people new so that they can represent him in a new era? Because I'm not sure if we realize it yet or not, I hope we do, that we are in a new era, Okay, we are not in the same era that we were in 10 years ago or five years ago or even two years ago. If I said 12 months can be a long time, guess what can be a long time? These last 22 months have been a long time, right? And we are not in the same era that we were in then as what we are in now, not as a society, but not spiritually as well. Okay, and so what if we reconsidered this idea of God is doing a new thing as in God is bringing a new thing about in his people to prepare them and ready them for this new era that we are in so that we can represent him properly because that's what we're here for. We're ambassadors, we're representatives, we're children of God, we're kings and priests unto our God, right? Yes. And so we get excited for this new thing, all right? But what if this new era is a new work in us that he's doing? And what if it's a further surrendering and refining and a calling and equipping us, okay, and pushing us out a little bit and using us? Would that be okay with us? Yeah. Yeah. Ow. (laughs) The songs for this evening, I didn't know what they were going to sing. How appropriate that one of them was about I surrender, okay? That's what it takes to be further used by him, for him to do a new thing in us. It takes surrender. That's what it's all about. And so what if it's not just about new wine, but also about being made into new wineskins? Because new wine can't be placed in old wineskins, We find it in Luke chapter 5, verse 37 through 39. It says, And no one puts new wine into old wineskins, or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined. Verse 38, But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both will be preserved. Verse 39, And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new For he says, the old is better. That one gets left out a lot. We're going to touch on that one toward the end, okay? But that question I just asked a moment ago about what if it's not just about the new wine? Because, ooh, new wine, we get all excited, right? What if it's not just about that? What if it's also about us being made into new wineskins because new wine can't be placed in old wineskins, right? And if we're going to be used as vessels of him, okay, because that's what wineskins are, wineskins are vessels, okay, so if we're going to be used as wineskins or as vessels of him, we need to be made into new wineskins to even be able to house, listen to this, to even be able to house what it is that's to be poured out of us by him. Wow. So I want to break it down for a few minutes because I could very easily and very quickly like burst into tears right now because I am so, um, I can't even put it into words. This word tonight is is been heavy on me, okay, for these last couple of days and um, there's an immense weight that's there um, based on it and it's not just a weight of responsibility like Lord make up the slack, please make it clear to your people, uh, even if it's not clear coming out of me, but it's also a weight because of the anointing that's attached to it, okay? And so the, the word of God, um, the word of God won't return void, and we know that, but there are times where the word that God has for his people has such a weight to it and such an importance to it and such an anointing attached to it because it's vital, 
And it's so completely vital. And there's a, you know, we can fit scripture to our lives. And then there's other times where God pinpoints and he says, this one, this one right here. Okay. But I want to make sure that you all feel that and that you all receive that. And so we're going to get very elementary here for a second so that we make sure that we know exactly what it is that we're talking about. Old wine, new wine, wine skins, like what? (laughs) And I want to make sure that we're all on the same page so that you can be just as excited and just as moved as what I have been in preparing all of this, okay? So first of all, wine skins. Let's talk about those for a second. These were containers, okay, that were used to house or to to have wine within them. They were often made out of animal skin, okay, the skin of goats or the skin of sheep. And they were used to store but also to transport wine in. And I want to think of that because what do we do? We transport the Spirit of God with us everywhere we go. We don't just stay in one place, right? We transport it. And that's what this was used for. It was used to store and to transport wine in. Basically, they were vessels, right? You've heard me say that word before. And so simple enough, okay? That's what a wineskin was. Easy peasy. So the thing is, is that the wine was placed into the wineskins before it was fully fermented. And that's very important because after fermentation, guess what happens in fermentation is expansion, okay? And so the idea here in this passage in Luke that we read is that old wineskins are stretched to their absolute limit once the wine inside of them ferments, okay? And so if you tried to use them again, they would burst, all right? Have we ever seen, like, a pregnant woman? That's all I could think of today while I was doing this, is, like, our bodies are absolutely, talk about fearfully and wonderfully made, right? And doesn't, it's almost like fermentation is going on inside of there as that baby is growing, right? And don't we get to where we're, like, literally, as women, like, stretched to our limit in every aspect, not just our stomach, right? Right? But that's what happens, stretched to the absolute limit. Now, our bodies are made to do that over and over again, okay? And some people do it more graciously than the rest of us, okay? But with wineskins, they couldn't be used for new wine again. You could not pour new wine into an old wineskin because then it was already stretched out. And if it tried to stretch more, it said it would burst open, right? That's what Jesus said in that scripture, And so if we move on from wineskins and we start speaking about the wine, we have to realize a couple of things. Prophetically uh, speaking, wine stands for transformation, okay? But when we're talking um, scripturally or biblically, new wine is what? New wine is the Holy Spirit, okay? And so um, it's quite clearly spoken of here that that is what Jesus is talking about. It's symbolic of Holy Spirit. It's in Uh, symbolic of his filling our lives, all right, and the infilling that there is of the Holy Spirit in each of us, all right, and we find this reference to new wine. It's actually written of by all three writers of the Synoptic Gospels, okay, which not everything that Jesus said we know. It says if everything that he did uh, was recorded, the books wouldn't be able to contain it, right, or the world wouldn't be able to contain the books, but it's... um, kind of intriguing when we see something spoken of in all three Gospels, all right? So Matthew speaks of it in chapter 9, Mark speaks of it in chapter 2, and this that we read was from Luke chapter 5. So all three of them bring this in, okay, and talk about this. And so again, our scripture, no one puts wine, new wine, into old wineskins, for the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled, and the wineskins will be ruined, But new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And so it's imperative that we become new wineskins, okay? That the transforming power of Holy Spirit is permitted to be at work in us, okay? How many times have you heard me say it? God is a gentleman, and he's not going to force himself upon anyone against their will, All right, and so we have to permit. That's what we were doing as we sang that song. We were telling God, I permit you to do and have your way in my life. I surrender to you. As I'm worshiping and I have my hands out, I'm listing everything I can possibly think of. 
I give you my family. I give you my home. I give you ministry. I give you any amount of anointing that you've placed on me. I give you any creativity that you've given me. I place it all back in your hands. I surrender it all back to you because in my hands, I can't do anything with it that's going to make kingdom impact, okay, or eternal impact. But if we surrender it back to him, he's the one that gave it to us to begin with. And if we surrender it back to him, we're permitting him to use those things in our lives. And so that's what this is. Becoming a new wineskin is this transforming power of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. But we're not going to become new wineskins against our will. If we want to be an old, worn out, stretched out, beyond its limits, old wineskin, we can do that for the rest of our lives. And we can be as bitter as we want to be, and we can be as worn out as we want to be, and we can have no amount of the fruits and the gifts of the Spirit flowing through us as what we want, because we won't surrender to the work the Holy Spirit wants to and desires to do within us. Amen? All right, so it's one thing to come under a touch of the anointing, okay, under like a momentary uh, feeling of the presence of Holy Spirit. And I, I pray and hope that we've all at least experienced that in our lives, okay? We talked about it uh, last week that um, I hope it doesn't take us four songs to come in on Wednesday night and, and get, know that we're under the presence of God because I preach so long they only get to sing three songs. And so if it's going to take us four songs to know we're under the presence of God, then we're all in trouble because we only get to do three, right? So there's times where we come under like a touch of, all right? Now, I hope we want more than just a touch of the Holy Spirit or more than to just know that we've been in the presence of God and then we walk out the same as what we were when we came in. And it made me think of, have you ever heard somebody say, well, I had a touch of the flu? Well, like, you either had the flu or you didn't have the flu, you know? Like, I had a touch, of the, I just touched it. I didn't, like... I didn't grab it. I just, I had a touch of the flu or it just touched me. Okay. I don't want just a touch of the Holy Spirit. Okay. If I'm going to get the flu, I only want a touch of the flu, but for Holy Spirit, I don't want just a touch of the Holy Spirit. I want him to like grab a hold of me and shake me. Okay. I don't want him to just like, oh yeah, I touched you. Oh, look at her go. Okay. And then him to move away or for me to not permit him don't put your hands on me. Why are you trying to move me? I don't want to do that. What did Paul say? I'll become even more undignified than this, right? Yeah. And so we don't want to just experience him momentarily, right? It's another thing altogether if we're going to be a container of Holy Spirit, okay, that can steward, all right, what God puts in us. Think of that. We have to steward what it is that God puts in us. We know about being stewards in reference to what? money. That's what it's always talked about, being a good steward. So God has blessed me. I have increased. His favor is upon my finances. I'm a good steward of that. I use it to bless others. I give to the church. I do all these things. It's being a good steward of what he's blessed us with financially. But do we think of being good stewards in the sense of all the other things that God does in our life? Because it's not all about money, right? Yeah. So what about stewarding what it is that we are supposed to be a container of so that we can then pour it out, right? So to be a container or a vessel of Holy Spirit, all right, to where we can hold it, to where we have the capacity in the Spirit to hold what it is that God pours into our life, all right? It's one thing to be touched of God, to receive from him momentarily, but it's another thing altogether to receive that impartation of the Holy Spirit on a level that it isn't just momentary, okay, but that we actually steward it and that we steward it well, okay? And so when the wineskin is prepared, we don't need to have momentary touches of God in our life, okay? We can have a continual flow of increase of Holy Spirit power and Holy Spirit anointing and Holy Spirit influence and the authority of Jesus Christ being used in our lives and all of those kind of things, okay? Imagine a continual flow of increase of his presence and of his anointing and of his power in our lives. Is that something that we desire? Yeah, amen. Yeah, whoop, whoop. <laughs> So if we move into verse 39 there, okay, there's a, 
there's a spiritual principle to see. And uh, it says, no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. Now, um, the principle is that we often, okay, let's just say in like our human selves, okay, our nature as humans or um, speaking carnally, all right, is that we become comfortable with the familiar, don't we? Yeah, we become very comfortable with the familiar. Guess how comfortable we are with the familiar? You all sit in the same seats almost every week. Okay, a couple of you change it up a little bit, but I know where to look and who I'm going to see when I look at a certain part of the room. Why? Because we become comfortable in what's familiar, and it can completely throw us off just to sit on the, like one day, I want to walk in and just see it like this, like, but I don't know if you'd even, look, they're moving. (laughs) I don't even know if you'd be able to pay attention though. Okay, because it's so out of our element, because we're so comfortable with the familiar. But we can get comfortable with the familiar in the things of God. All right? To become comfortable with what we have known and what we have experienced and what we have already tasted of God. All right? But those experiences are not to be a measuring stick. All right? The Word of God, it's our plumb line. It's what we know. We measure all other things against the word of God to see if they, uh, they come into alignment with it, okay? But our experiences with God are not to be the measuring stick with which we measure everything else, okay? It's not to be the, if I can just get back to that, okay? To that place or to that type of service or, or to those, that set of worship songs. That was like my, I mean, do we have our go-to's? I have my go-tos. I have my go-to music that I need to, like, in a hurry, be in the presence of God and do some warring. I have my go-to songs. I do. Okay? I put these ones on and, like, yeah, I'm ready. Right? But we better be able to war even if we don't have the right playlist on our phone. Okay? And we shouldn't use that playlist as our measuring stick to what the presence of God is supposed to feel like or be like or look like in our lives either. Okay, if I could just get back to that type of service, if I could just have that level of blessing again, if I could just have that feeling one more time, right? Yeah. How many times? I mean, I love the feeling of being in God's presence. And so there's times where you can walk into service and you're like, yeah. And there's other times where you're like, oh, that was nice, right? (laughs) It's not about the feeling, okay? And it doesn't mean that God was any less at work in people's lives if we just didn't get the feeling of being in his presence, okay? She's moving back. She couldn't pay attention. (laughs) I love it. Um, But we know that scripture says, come, taste and see that the Lord is good, right? And we, many of us, have done that. We have tasted and seen that the Lord is good. And we've experienced something of God. And that is completely awesome. All right? And sometimes if we're not careful then, we think that what we've experienced, especially if it's been some of the most blow-my-mind amazing times, okay, or showings of God, we then think or we begin to think that what we've experienced is the full thing or the fullness of God, or the full measure of what he has, as in, I'm going to give you everything I have for you right now, and then I just want you to spend the rest of your life trying to circle back around and find that again. Do you think that's what God does? No, but we act like it is, even if we won't admit it. We're doing that. We're trying to, I'm trying to get back to that. I'm trying to get back to that moment, that service, that song, that feeling, that momentary touch, just that touch of Holy Spirit that I felt upon me. I couldn't help while I was doing this. I'm going to talk about the song here in a second of Pour Me Out. Um, And so Sound Booth was a little bit different. There was like room to lean up against it, and there was a service here. Okay, I don't even remember if it was, I think it was a Wednesday night. I think I was preaching that night. And there was um, tongues and interpretation that had come through. And God was saying, I am pouring into you right now 
my anointing. And I'm going to tell you, I have never had an experience like that moment in my life. I'm not saying it was the end all of all experiences I've ever had with God, but I've never had something so like real and legitimate in my life to where I fell back against the sound booth and literally felt like God was pouring something into me. And I'm going, whoa. Like if the sound booth wouldn't have been there, I would have been on the floor. Okay. And as I'm preparing this tonight, I'm going, how easy would it be for me to make that experience, because I can pull it back to my remembrance so quickly, how easy it would it be for me to make that experience my measuring stick? I just want to feel that again, because, like, who doesn't want to feel that again? It was amazing. I was in the presence of God. I knew that the word he was speaking was the thing that he was doing right at that time. That's awesome. There's nothing wrong with that, okay? Okay. How easy would it be, though, for me to make that experience my measuring stick? I just want that again. If I could just get back to that again. I wonder what song we were singing. Who was it that spoke that word? Oh, if we could, if we could just recreate that perfect storm again so I could feel that one more time. Hmm. So sometimes if we're not careful, we might think that those experiences okay, or what we've experienced is the full thing or is the fullness of God or is all that he has had for us or is the standard that's to be kept or at least the thing that we are supposed to try to um, revisit as often as possible. And then God comes along and he does something new, okay, or he does something different than what we've experienced before or something that's out of our comfort zone, Okay, and we just don't know how to handle that. Okay, Uh, I got a phone call today, out of the blue. Someone's supposed to do a funeral on Friday. They were exposed to someone with COVID. They can't do the funeral now. Are you available Friday afternoon? Can you do this funeral for this lady's husband? Sure. I call the woman on the phone. Talk about like never experienced it before. Tongues and interpretation right on the phone. Through the woman whose husband just died. While I'm on the phone, I'm like typing notes in my computer as she's talking, so I make sure like the service is what she has envisioned, and here she goes, and I'm like, well, this is new, as I'm typing, and so I just keep typing what she's saying. I'm like, huh, you just said that same thing to me a couple weeks ago. I'm listening, yeah, and I'm typing it out as she's talking, going, I have never, like, that's never happened before. Now, how easy would it be for me to go, well, you've never done that like that before, so that couldn't have been you. I've never experienced that before. Like, I've never been playing in a funeral with someone before and them be the one that gave, like, a word, you know? And so, how easy would it be then for our minds to just, don't they just go sometimes? Well, I don't know. And did that word line up? And and was it according to Scripture? And do I really know this woman's level of spirituality? And and maybe she just wanted attention or maybe this or maybe that. I mean, come on, guys. Let's be honest. All these things can flood our minds, right? And just because then he hasn't done something in a way he's done it before, or just because he moves on someone else different than he moves on us, okay? Or I I absolutely love my daughter and son-in-love are sitting back there. Yay, I didn't know they were coming tonight. And absolutely love Matthew. And Matthew and I both have experienced God in a different way from each other, okay? So I'm like touchy-feely, emotional, like, ooh, I'm in God's presence. And Matthew's like, yes, God was here, and things are very serious, and it's wonderful. And that is not casting any reflection because he can, like, talk circles around me, okay, about apologetics and about all these things and studying in his word. And remember a couple weeks ago when I said, like, what side of the Bible is it on and blah, blah, blah. Like, that's Matthew and his Bible and, and all these kind of things. But guess what? God moves on us differently, and God speaks to us differently, okay? And so he's telling me this whole big long story. I'm not going to get into it, okay, but about this book that he wanted for Christmas and da, 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 da. And it's about these people who have, like, tried to prove Christ without using scripture because it's a good way to witness to ones who won't look at scripture or don't value scripture. And he's telling me all that stuff and I'm going, wow, it's like so much easier for me. He just has to give me goosebumps and I'm like, okay, God. (laughs) But like with intellectuals, like, oh my gosh, like he brings it around in such this amazing way, right? Now I could easily go, well, Matthew didn't get goosebumps, so I don't really think he knows he was in the presence of God. 
And Matthew could say, she don't even know who these people are that I'm talking about. And they're like heroes of the faith to me. And who does she think she is? And how is she a pastor? And maybe he thinks that. I don't know. I hope he doesn't. <laughs> but how? No, no, let's not. I think we're almost out of time. No. <laughs> but just because he moves on someone else differently than he moves on us, how am I to think that like I'm the standard of how God moves or speaks or, or, or what ministers to others, right? And so then we begin to doubt whether something is really a move of God because we've never seen it happen that way, okay? Or is that person truly hearing correctly or, or they didn't do it the way I've always heard it done? Or if we think about it, like, my God, how prideful that would be of us if we did come at it that way. And there are times that we do, and I'll admit it, and I hope that you guys would too. But if we think about it, how prideful would it be for me to think that the way God has moved on me is the way that he is supposed to move on everybody, or because he moves on someone else differently or speaks through them differently or however it ends up working, that that can't be God because I've never experienced it that way before. I am not the end all to what there is to experience with God, right? And so when we bring it around this way, then it should actually make us shudder at the thought, maybe we even become physically nauseous when we realize that we have actually lived our lives in Christendom like that before, okay, and we should be running to the altar with tears streaming down our face if necessary to say, I am so sorry that I have placed you in such a small, little, minute, tiny box that I would think that it's only what you have ever showed to me or had me experience that that's how you would move and work in all of your creation, Am I kidding? No. God is so big that I can't wrap my mind around him. And if I could wrap my mind around him and explain to you everything about him, he wouldn't be a God worth serving. If I could figure him out in my mind, he would not be worth me surrendering my life to. If I could figure him out in my mind, he wouldn't have been big enough to take the sins of the world upon him when he died on the cross. If I could figure out everything there was to know about God, I definitely wouldn't be standing here right now. I'd be out somewhere else going, how is this all there is? But I know this isn't all there is. And I know he has more for each of us. And I know that his spirit and his power is alive and at work in every single one of us that will surrender to him. Yeah, but that we would ever dare to judge a move of God based on if we have ever experienced him moving in that way again. And I don't care if that's through healing. I don't care if that's through prophecy. I don't care if that's through tongues and interpretation, which is different than prophecy. I hope we realize. Okay, I don't care if that's through uh, spontaneous worship. I don't care how it is. Any other way that he chooses to display his power and that he chooses to display his majesty and his might and his presence to the world. I'm going to go, okay, God, you're God. So you do your thing. I'll step out of the way. I've never seen it done like this before. I have to admit, wow. But you're God. Yeah. But there's something in, our, in us, in our, um, in our nature as humans or, or that comes naturally to us carnally, okay, that doesn't always immediately want the new thing. Because the new thing takes us out of our comfort zone. And so sometimes people resist the new thing because they're comfortable with the old thing, right? Yeah. Verse 39 again. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new. For he says, the old is better. Woe to us. I'm going to say, we ever hear the word woe in scripture? <laughs> like, woe unto you. Okay, woe to us if we call the new wine that God is pouring out not as good as the old wine of days gone by and of a new era or of an old era that no longer exists. And have we ever heard it? I, re 
remember them tent revivals back in the 50s with the sawdust floor and we were there for four hours and you used your funeral fan because there was no air conditioning and the power of God was so strong there were people just laid out everywhere. I can't wait to get back to that again. Guess what? That era doesn't exist anymore. And it doesn't just exist anymore in the fact that there aren't little root beer stands with people on roller skates and there isn't that kind of music that plays anymore and people don't wear poodle skirts. That era doesn't exist anymore even in the kingdom. And that era doesn't exist anymore in people's hearts and how God can reveal himself to them. And if God tried to move on a a body of believers in the same way that he did back in the 50s, Nobody would be able to relate. So the word of God doesn't change. And he doesn't change. But as society changes and as our lifestyles change and all these things happen, God is going to bring around and speak to people in a way that they understand that they can know who he is. A whooping or a whooping? Oh, okay. I was picturing like a whooping, like what I didn't know. <laughs> but the point of it all, okay, is that we need to have these new wineskins. That's the point of all of this, okay? It's not just to get excited or to clap our hands or to go, yeah, amen. The point is that we become these new wineskins in order to be a container that can house all that it is that God wants to fill us with, that he wants to pour into us, okay, and to then have it poured out to others. Because we're not just supposed to pour it in and become fat with the knowledge that we have, right, of the word. No, we're supposed to pour it back out again, okay, and to pour it out on others. And it's both going to be for their benefit, but it's also going to be for the furthering of the kingdom of God, all right? And so if we think of the song, Fill Me Up, okay, Um, I like the Tasha Cobbs version, but again, playlist, right? Um, So if we think of the song, Fill Me Up, Fill Me Up Till I Overflow, I want to run over, I want to run over. Okay, and then if we think of the song, Pour Me Out, I love if we like sing them back to back sometimes, okay? Pour me out wherever I go, wherever I am, pour me out, pour me out. That we could just be a vessel that he fills up and that he pours out. And so it's not just supposed to leak out of us a little at a time. Because if something just leaks out of us, then we can never be filled to overflowing because we would just be constantly losing a little bit at a time. It's not just, like the Spirit's not just supposed to ooze out of us a little. No, we're supposed to be filled to overflowing, that we become like fountains of living water to people. Not that, oh, I think they might know that I love Jesus because I said, have a blessed day after I went through the line today. (laughs) No, it's not just, (laughs) Shorty's laughing. It's not just supposed to like leak out of us. Okay, we're supposed to be a fountain of living water. We're supposed to be a vessel of his spirit, okay? And then being a new wine skin is important because of that pouring out. Fill me up till I overflow. I want to run over. I want to run over. Joel chapter 2 verse 19 says, The Lord will answer and say to his people, Behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. So what did it say? If you've had the old wine, you don't immediately desire the new wine. He said in Luke chapter 5, but back in Joel, he says, when I send you this new wine and this oil, you're going to be satisfied by them. So if we're so stuck on the old oil or on the old wine, Okay, that we can't even know that we're supposed to desire the new wine yet. But yet he's telling us, I'm going to give it to you and you're going to be satisfied with it. So my question for each of us tonight, okay, and it's, it's to myself too, all right? I had times of prayer today going through all of this. Like there's times where I step on my own toes or where God steps on mine before I can step on yours, right? So the question tonight, okay, is are we desiring the old wine more than the new? 
Or are we trying to go back to the old era instead of being prepared for the new era that we're being ushered into ever so quickly? All right? And are we looking for the new thing just outwardly or as if it's like out on the horizon? Or do we realize and are we open to him doing a new thing within us? Even if we don't know exactly what that's going to look like and we can't control it and it's not all going to be boxed up and packaged real pretty maybe. But if we want to be a container and a vessel of Holy Spirit to be poured out upon a people, okay, living in a new era, then we have to be a new wineskin ourselves. And we do that by asking God to renew us. And we do that by surrendering to him. And we do that by apologizing. We do that by um, telling him, oh, I am so sorry that I've made it this instead of what you wanted it to be. Or I'm so sorry that I've tried to stay stuck in these things because this is where I was comfortable. And I repent of that right now. And I surrender to you and I ask you all of these things that you've placed in my hands. I give them back to you because you're the only one that can do with them what needs done. And I surrender to you these things. And that is becoming a new wine skin that he can pour new wine into. And that it can expand within us to overflowing. We're going to close tonight with a little piece of a lyric by a song. By, it's by Hillsong called New Wine. <laughs> this is a playlist song. <laughs> But it says, make me your vessel, make me an offering, make me whatever you want me to be. I came here with nothing, but all you have given me, Jesus, bring new wine out of me. Wow. There's a line right before that. My very favorite part, it says, so I yield to you and to your careful hand. Here's the part. When I trust you, I don't need to understand. That speaks to me. Mercy Music can come to the front. But that part right there speaks to me so much. I yield to you and to your careful hand because when I trust you, I don't have to understand. Guess what Pastor Rose likes to do? I like to understand and I like a heads up and, 